sterile offspring. Sound familiar? And how do you know they can't breathe? Well, because all the animals in Jurassic Park are female. Hmm. Ensuring 100% sterility in all Judas females. Utilization of suicide gene, leading to a life expectancy of 120 to 180 days. When is this thing's gonna die soon anyway? So they built in a fail-safe device. Which is what? For your lifespan. They were designed to die. They are breeding. The dinosaurs are breeding. And that's not all. They're coming back. Occasionally, you get lucky. Maybe two of your creations will turn on each other and you can slip away. Or you might get really lucky. Come over here, you hot monster. <laughs> but more often than not, it ends badly. I guess we'll never see the genetic engineering feel-good hit of the summer. Hey, the park opened and everyone had a great time. There was cotton candy and pretzels shaped like triceratops. That just doesn't fit the blockbuster format. Hollywood is in the business of telling exciting stories. For the rest of us, once the credits roll and the lights come up, we like to leave the scary bits back in the theater. Now, I don't know if there's anything to worry about with those mosquitoes in Malaysia, but I was thinking about that proverbial broken clock that still has the correct time twice a day. And maybe there are a couple lessons to learn from Hollywood. When the monsters come a calling, study the schematics, always carry a Zippo lighter, there may need to be a blood sacrifice. And you know what? It doesn't hurt to familiarize yourself with the local subway schedule. Come on. For Slate Video, I'm Brian Mallow. If you're blue and you don't know where to go to, why don't you go where fashion sits? In the reef! Different types who wear a day coat and... <laughs> Is that the end? <laughs> well, that's the thing, isn't it? Science fiction films of this nature in the 50s always ended with a credit card that went up, a title card. <laughs> this is not the end, this is the beginning. Yeah, or a and, question mark. Or a question mark. Well, you know, when I watched it, I thought I was uh, looking at a bunch of science fiction films, but it turned out, with the exception of Blade Runner, I'd have to say all of these films, and I'll just tell you what the films uh, we just saw were Jurassic Park, Mimic, Splice, Frankenstein, Young Frankenstein, Blade Runner, I Am Legend, Deep Blue Sea is the shark movie, and Species. They're all horror films, really. Yeah, we have an interesting blurring of the genres here. I made the, the statement at the beginning, uh, I won't bother backering it up, but the, the, the first um, science fiction book was Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. It's also obviously thought of as the birth of the modern horror genre as well. And there certainly is a blurring of the distinction there, but horror has a supernatural aspect normally, and science fiction has a reasoned extrapolation to it. Some of the things we saw here were reasoned extrapolations, this notion that you can build in a kill switch, uh, either breed all of one gender or have a, a, a shortened lifespan, uh, a suicide gene, that sort of thing, is a, is a scientific concept. The idea that the scientific concept might well go awry, that those who have good intentions don't foresee all the possible ramifications. Is a scientific concept in itself. That's right, <laughs> and it's also very much a, a core message of science fiction as a literature, as well as in film and television. The law of unattended consequences is a, a buzzword in, in uh, business um, 
writing these days, but it's something that science fiction has been dealing with Isn't for decades. Isn't that just Murphy's law? Uh, it's, yeah, what can go wrong will, but Murphy, you know, the, the thing about Murphy is you can easily see that that's, that's a bad idea. You know it's a bad <laughs> idea. Don't do that. And the thing about so much of the rosy perspective that uh, you've got uh, uh, Jurassic Park there at the outset, welcome to Jurassic Park. You didn't use that clip, right. but, you know, Attenborough is so effusive in, in his childlike joy in what he's created. Uh, and he simply hasn't thought it through. And this is often the case. And this comes back to our question of governance. The people who most enthusiastically want to do something are the least well disposed to be the ones who decide whether or not it should be done. Right. You know, that was, I had read Jurassic Park before the movie yeah, had come out. And I, they, there were a lot of changes. And I think in every case, it was the wrong change. The, the right people died in the book. The safari hunter security guy, he lived in the book. He was the only one with the proper respect for them. Right. The founder of the park died the most miserable death. Um, really, he gets eaten. He gets bitten by these little tiny dinosaurs, a swarm of them. They poison him. He's laying there. Uh, the poison seeking in. They're ripping flesh off his face. And he's thinking that this is just the programmer's fault and Euro Jurassic Park will be fine. Be he goes yes. to his death thinking everything's going to be fine. And in the movie, they go, I'm not going to support your, endorse your park. Well, and he goes, me neither. And they all, and they drive you know, off. <laughs> and the, the biggest financial success of Hollywood's treatment of biotech is the Jurassic Park franchise. Now, I often make an argument that Michael Crichton isn't really a science fiction writer. He's an anti-science fiction writer. And again, on my website, sfwriter.com slash Crichton.htm, I make the case at length that <laughs> well, this got is a, a guy, almost everything. I do, uh, that uh, mallow.com, get out of <laughs> that this is a guy who made his fortune pandering to the fear, uh, the same fear that Hollywood has often pandered to. There is this desire um, to want to get bad messages out because they're more exciting and because it's way easier to invoke a fear response than a thoughtfully reflective response. But I always, you know, I enjoyed a bunch of his books, and I looked at them. I didn't take them to be anti-science. Oh, they're I took totally anti-science. I didn't really take them. No, 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 I didn't read that one about the environment, and I know he spoke about it. But, uh, but next the is, is like, his one on biotech, and it's like it's Murphy's Law writ large. Anything you do with biotech, people will die. But it's uh, the search if you're for tell a story. Don't you have to? It doesn't it have to be about the day that everything went to hell? Otherwise, there's no story. Well, I don't want to get into literary theory here, although as <laughs> my, my ex experimental shtick as a science fiction writer for the last several years has been to write books without antagonists, to, uh, to get beyond this notion that the only thing worth writing about is A, things going wrong, and B, human beings in conflict with each other. Um, uh, Robert Wright's uh, Non-Zero had a profound effect on me, who was the moderator of the session I was at this morning, the notion that in interactions between groups, the outcome can be positive for both sides, whereas the standard fictional and very much the standard Hollywood metaphor has been there's a winner and there's a loser in every interaction. And I don't think that makes sense. And certainly for biotech and the governance of biotech, what we're looking for is win-win outcomes, where it's good for the economy, it's good for those who have a vested interest in it, the, the private sector, and it's good for the general public. And what we have to try and find is not the Hollywood model where it's just going to go wrong. The Hollywood message very much over and over again is don't go there. <laughs> uh, there was, you know, the other title card that used to come up with 1950s science fiction films was there are some things that man was not meant to know. <laughs> and I don't think that's true. I don't think that's a rational position for homo sapiens to take, man of wisdom to take about anything. Yeah, it's pretty limited. I think mean, the things that make a good movie, the, story, the kinds of stuff that make for good stories and movies are not the same things that make for a good life here in the real world. Right. Um, now, on the other hand, there also is a value in the cautionary tale. And one of the reasons Frankenstein has endured for almost two centuries is that it is a cautionary tale. The one that you didn't uh, allude to in the video here that's had several film treatments is probably the first, re when we really think about biotech, uh, in science fiction, people don't necessarily think of Frankenstein. They think of H.G. Wells and the Island of Dr. Moreau, mm. which is about oh, yeah. making chimera life forms. It was ve the very first treatment of that. And again, it's a 
what can go wrong with this? Uh, you know, don't mess with this. This is dangerous stuff. Kind of a cautionary tale. H.G. Wells got there first on a lot of topics. Oh man, he did everything. He did. Every, he's the father uh, of the genre, and as the genre, as social comment too. I think very important man. Well, one thing I found right away where I wish if I'd had more time and, and wanted to make a half hour video, the things that all the movies had in common really struck me. And, and some of them were subtly there. All of them have scenes where people are closing doors and a monster is trying to get in. Yeah. It might be a shark or a yeah. bug or whatever it is. You know, but there's other weird ones you, like, you know did you see both credits were three years later? One was Mimic and one was I Am Legend yeah. and both of them were three years later. But you know that closing <laughs> door thing, I mean, I will go into literary theory for you, that's Pandora's box. That is a visual metaphor of Pandora's box. The notion that if you open the box of knowledge, you will <laughs> never be able to close it again. And it comes back to that message, there are some things that man was not meant to know. Now that said, my own Hollywood experience of the last 18 months yeah. was Flash Forward, the ABC TV series based on my novel of the same name. And the notes that kept coming back from the network were to the effect that every time you talk any science at all, you lose 100,000 viewers the moment the first polysyllable comes out of the mouth of an actor. Which means that you don't get to the nuanced argument. You get to the exciting, uh, rampaging monster scene. Yeah. And, you know, somebody mentioned very thoughtfully, somebody sitting over here this morning, Gattaca, the film Gattaca, yes. which was a very thoughtful treatment of a lot of biotech issues. I don't think you had a clip from Gattaca in there. No. Um, but it made nowhere near the money that any of these other films yeah, did. Gattaca is, film. is really a film that's well regarded, but yeah. did not scare the bejeebers out of people. Well, what became very obvious was that to me was that the language of film and that it doesn't even matter what the story's about. Maybe it's about dinosaurs or a mutated bug, but what the actual suspense consists of is things like how do I get from here to there when there's a monster in the way yes. and how and it's how the director creates this suspense so in most of the movies uh, here's some things they had in common I saw helicopters in, in at least three or four of them people climbing up and down ladders people climbing up through a hole in the roof to the next level even Blade Runner has that at yes. the end of the and where it's just and I kind of thought like what you were saying it's it's the language of film and maybe I was thinking of Joseph Campbell like there's always like a journey into something, into a dark building, well, into Jonah, you know, into you the whale. We, we had uh, drinks last night in the bar at the hotel, and you mentioned uh, the helicopter thing. And I was thinking about why that's a recurring motif. And the helicopter <laughs> is, doesn't have a biological analog. There is no whirligig life form for flying around. It is, in fact, the airplane does. Birds, bats, insects. The helicopter doesn't. There's and some seeds that, one of the, some seeds that yeah. twirl down, but you don't want to be in a helicopter that can only go down, <laughs> believe me. You want one that can go up. And what, the point being there, that the helicopter is the thing that we've made that doesn't have a model in nature, and yet works very effectively. And it actually is appropriate when you're talking about creating, we talked about de novo life forms, life forms created that don't have an analog in the existing uh, tree of life. Uh, and I think that's why you see the helicopter motif there. Yeah. I also noticed the monsters have tend to have very good timing. <laughs> As a comedian, I could appreciate this. There's always like some moment where like in Jurassic Park, she gets the power on and says into the walkie-talkie, we're in business, and then a velociraptor appears. Yes. And Samuel L. Jackson makes a big speech and the uh, giant shark comes yes. up and, and takes him away. Um, so uh, I, I did. The, well, I guess, let's, let's uh, you know, yeah. we've been a bit negative here. And of the clips you showed, I got to say, the most interesting one to me is Blade Runner. To me, For too. two reasons. One is it's not a monster movie. No. Uh, it's about uh, replicating humans. I mean, we're, and, and whether or not what rights those humans have, what obligation creators have to their creations, and what motivates us to want to do this. It's actually a very intriguing philosophical story. Jurassic Park, you know, the Ian Malcolm character, who was the chaos theoretician um, played by um, Jeff Goldblum, uh, Jeff Goldblum uh, is a fascinating character. But in essence, all he does is intone, there are some things that man was not meant to know, over <laughs> yes. and over again in that film. Um, and it's easy to make that case when you look around at making monsters or re, re um, animating things that are long dead, like, a, like Frankenstein, which was dead to begin with, the parts that made up Frankenstein's monster, or bringing back um, mostly Cretaceous, not Jurassic life forms in Jurassic Park. Uh, but Rob wanted to be a paleontologist I did, I before, did. It, before he decided on science fiction. That's absolutely true. But, but 
the creation or modification of human life is the most interesting issue. Gattaca dealt with that and Blade Runner dealt with that. And I think those are the ones, if you want to engage philosophically, uh, if you were building, say, a university level course about Hollywood's treatment of bioethics and biotechnology issues, those would be yeah. foundational films. Um, Young absolutely Frankenstein, most, <laughs> not so much. Yeah, absolutely the most thoughtful, one of my favorite films, and I'm really disappointed that I couldn't at least get in the scene where he says it's not an easy thing to meet your maker as yes. he comes face to face yes. with his maker. But I just I couldn't uh, really fit it in. But beautiful movie, and it, and actually, and the book that it's based on by Philip K. Dick, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? There's a lot of stuff in there that uh, is subtle, especially if you haven't read the book. But there's an idea of he was fascinated with the idea of what it means to be human and what defines a human. And in this story, it was empathy, and that's what he comes back that's to right. a lot. And there's lack of empathy, and that's what there's a test. The Voigt Kampf test is about determining whether these creatures even have an empathic response to things like like uh, the, bugs or animal related. Things. Otherwise, not particularly notable. Terminator Salvation, the most recent Terminator film, deals that with that was, same issue. Yeah. Uh, that the fundamentally the human heart, metaphorically, not physically, is what separates us from the machine. And uh, somebody at uh, this morning's session on science fiction. Uh, uh, the section that I was in as a science fiction writer, I should say, uh, brought up this question of we don't even know what life is. We do wrestle with this question and we still have a desire to want to say uh, viscerally that life has some special status and that anything created in a lab by a chemist or a biologist or a genetic engineer is therefore not really life. And that's part of the philosophy that science fiction deals with. One of the questions science fiction often deals with is expanding our definition of personhood, which of course historically through time, it's gone from being you know, male landowners to being all human beings, and I suspect we will see it continue to expand. Right, so even if we create uh, a human, a synthetic human that's more human than human and right. even smarter than us and stronger than us, it's still okay to enslave it. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and then the same thing would have like in, in no, the No, I mean that's of, absolutely that's the, the message. The I don't agree that it's good to enslave it. <laughs> it's absolutely. Believe me, believe wow, me. you Canadians have a dark side. No, 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 um, no. I just, <laughs> January uh, 2013's coming up. It's the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm all set for my celebrations, my friend. <laughs> Well, replicants everywhere appreciate that, I'm All sure. Right. Um, and it's the same issue that we're coming at in another way if we, are de if we develop artificial intelligence mid-century, like Ray Kurzweil and some other Well, this is uh, a, very interesting because at the opening session this morning, there, we, we tried to bring together the two emergent technologies we're talking about, which are biotech and information technology. And in fact, that's where they overlap the most, is life actually carbon-based. Organic chemistry means carbon chemistry. Is it carbon-based by necessity or is life something else? And I think where you really are going to see the intersection of those two is when we start making thinking, self-aware, conscious machines. It's going to be way uh, more interesting to debate that issue, whether that is life, yeah. uh, rather than the, the pretty obvious case that's made by a movie like Blade Runner that obviously Roy Batty, the character Rutger Hauer plays, is obviously alive. The, uh, the character uh, uh, Rachel in the film is obviously alive. And the message that's clear in the director's cut of the film, if not in the original theatrical cut, that Deckard, the um, Harrison Ford character, who is a replicant and also is obviously alive. That's the easy question. If it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. The hard question is, if it's in silico instead of in carbon, is it in fact uh, precluded from our definitions of life? And I would argue, no, it's not precluded. In the past couple of years, I've read some great science fiction uh, that deals with issues of, of like mind uploading. And so- An example not... would be my novel, Mind Scan. Exactly. <laughs> um, the, uh, this is a great, subject and you know some stuff that seems very far-fetched if you look at things you know the whole idea that we're moving away from uh you know everything becoming bits so it's already happened to our music collection very few people no one has records very few people have cds that's right. all been digitized um i have a huge library i'm sure all the writers here have very large libraries and which we treasure and we can't imagine parting but the younger generation of people coming up i always i feel like i'm going to be that guy you know mr mallow what are those those are books you know <laughs> <laughs> Put down that Kindle and, you know, like, but, and as far-fetched as it seems, that's the next thing. It's like digitizing all this stuff. If they make developments, give right. them 50 or 100 years, if you can digitize consciousness, 
Why this travel was, in this meat bag? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and this was, was the, profound, the profound point that was made in the foundational talk this morning is, in fact, that life, DNA, the genetic code, is a digital code. Uh, it's yeah. a four, uh, it's, it's quaternary instead of binary. It's a four uh, base code instead of a two base code that we normally use for when we talk about digital information. But it's a code and you can represent it. And it either is adenosine or it is thymine or it is guanine or it is cytosine. It is not in between. Right. It is one or the other. Life is digital, one or the other or the other or the other. Life is digital in that sense. Life is information, information that can self replicate. And that, I think, is the fundamental message that science fiction has been way on the leading edge of, of getting out. Yeah, like even this could be a simulation. Oh, and I alluded to that you, this yes. morning, absolutely. We might indeed be a simulation, either a digital simulation or somebody's advanced science project. So I, we've got a two minute warning. Do you have something really succinct? Well, I, someone else would have to judge that. <laughs> but, you know, there, there's no room in what you just discussing. Where's their mic? No, no, but where's the mic for you? That's what I'm saying to our runner here. But go ahead. We don't have time to... Uh, there's, there's no room in your discussion here for ambiguity or poetics. No, there's 25 minutes. There's no room for a lot of nuance. We're trying to get to the core of the issue in a very well, limited I time. Say, yeah. I would say contrary to that, actually, that ambiguity and poetics are the core of the matter, much as much as, if not more. And so uh, now that's what, with all this imagery, it, it's... Too, you know, it, the, it lacks that, if I could just say that. And no projection of the digital model onto any uh, living activity can uh, override that. Uh, a digital is from zero to one, but it, it has to go from one to the other. It it's, is it, a digital projection onto an, an analog process in many ways. So I think you DNA know, is not an analog process. Yeah, DNA yes. is actually fundamentally a digital because process. You think and I got it, no, no, it isn't. It's based on it. four bases. <laughs> we only have a matter of seconds. Of and way. and the other point that I want to very quickly make is I think we're in a way better place right now as a species when we treat as a binary question whether or not you're a person than saying that a black American is three fifths of a person. It's way better to be uh, totally on or off on personhood than to be nuanced about it. Yeah. And they are good questions to raise. They're yeah. totally good questions but, and to raise. As far as We've the got 30 seconds. That, that was kind of the point there. It's like, that's the Hollywood vid. That's not our perception of the issue, but that's the only story that Hollywood, that, with some exceptions, like Blade Runner and Gattaca, um, this is the kind of, you know, Hollywood's pretty limited. Everything has a love. The, the Jurassic Park book didn't have a love, love interest story. There was no love story. They needed it for the movie, though. Right. So is there anything we could say about the Hollywood percent? Like, is there anything... Uh, you know, the one thing we, we, we all you talked about here was uh, film, and I got to say, Hollywood is also television. Yes. Very interesting debate about these questions of artificial life versus uh, non artificial life in the re imaging of Battlestar, Battlestar Galactica. Galactica. Very yeah. worth uh, watching for that philosophical debate. Yeah. Well, I think we're out of time, right? Yeah. Live Thank long you very and prosper. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>